Ladies and gentlemen, I have pleasure in introducing a motion picture which tells in the story of New Zealand's development during recent years. It is less than three years ago since New Zealand's first Labour government was given a mandate to carry out a program of economic and social progress. That policy was put forward as a means of lifting New Zealand from the depression which had strangled New Zealand industrial life and broke the hearts of thousands of its best citizens during the five years ending in 1935. There is neither time nor scope here to compare the present with the past, but I would ask my audience to take their minds back to the period of the depression and to compare their standard of life in those days with their standards of life today. It will be for the people's general election as to what they think of the work and services of the for the period of the last three years. They will not have forgotten their experiences during the period of the depression, nor will they, will they be able to forget what has been done for them during the period which will end with the end of this parliament. Our mission is to build and not to destroy the social structure. And for that, we will have to expend the whole of the elements that enter into the everyday life of the people, including health, education, and general security. These things can come only from increasing production and given a plenty. I desire to thank the multitudes of people who have inspired the government and have inspired me with their goodwill and warm friendship. And I promise them in the name of labor that if returned again at the coming polls, they will not regret it. My gratitude to those who have assisted me comes from my heart. And my promise to them is that I shall remain in their service to the end of my days. Ladies and gentlemen, I commend to you this informative picture entitled New Zealand's History in the Making. No longer a rich man's club. No, it's a workshop now for remaking New Zealand. Late in 1935, history was made when the Governor-General, Lord Galway, called on Mr. Savage to form the first Labour government, and the destinies of this dominion were placed in Labour's hands. These noble pillars of New Zealand marble are no more solid or more enduring than the work of the Prime Minister, Mr. M. J. Savage, and his team. When the Labour Party took over, there were over 50,000 men unemployed. And that figure does not include the physically unfit, who were not at that time allowed to register or even receive any form of sustenance. Clothes drives and soup kitchens were the order of the day. Physically fit or unfit men, single or married, willing and able to work, were demoralized and humiliated by the conditions then existing. Single men were sent from their homes to work on public works camps. Slave camps, they were called in those days. Yes, sent to work on slave camps for the paltry sum of 10 shillings per week. Do you remember this? Backbreaking, low, tedious, and insanely expensive. Physical torture to no purpose. Muscle wrenching labor and driven hands, and waste of money. Gone are the days of the wheelbarrow and shovel you see depicted here. Just watch for the change. Today, these men are working under the best conditions in history, and instead of earning only 10 shillings a week in a slave camp, are now earning on an average about one pound a day. The latest machinery was installed. Here is the burden of soil transferred to the machine that cannot feel it. 
Man invents these ingenious machines. Why not use them? This modern machinery of the Public Works Department is building new roads, new aerodromes, railways, bridges. And so the great Public Works Department, at half the cost and twice the speed, marches on. Yes, all old useless cumbering things must go like these concrete walls. All obstacles to human progress. Here is the triumph of the new ideas. Well paid, the workers on the great Mohawka viaduct, the greatest in the southern hemisphere, broke all sorts of records. The time was shot to pieces. Rivets were driven at a world record rate. And remember, New Zealand engineers and New Zealand workers put this through. No hotter. Yes, it's a vision of the future. New Zealanders under labour rule can achieve wonders. Tunnel work is the worst known to mankind, dangerous and unhealthy. The old-fashioned method of men travelling into trucks gives way to the tunnel scoop. The scoop feels no hardship. Let it do the work. Just another instance of the common sense use by a Labour Minister of the proper plan for a big job. A roading survey revealed that 13,000 farmers had bad or no access to their properties. To give them access will necessitate the construction of 6,000 miles of backlot road at a cost of five million pounds. Already 1,500 miles have been completed, and it is estimated that the whole job will be completed well within the five-year plan. The modern big plant, such as that scoop you saw, and the carry-all you see now, solves the economic problem of major public works. Gone are the days of the futile, tedious fiddling with single-man implements. While others talked of putting roads into the backlog settlement, labor acted. The efficiency of the railway department is recognized. The nation's great railway workshops present scenes of activity. The nationalists left us a legacy of seven million pounds in unfinished and abandoned rail projects, on which amount three million five hundred thousand pounds interest has been paid without any possible hope of return to the taxpayer. History was made when Labour decided to finish the majority of these essential lines. The greatest transport advance recorded in years is the rail car. Here we see them under construction in our own workshop. At the inauguration of these new services, we see genial Dan Sullivan taken for a ride. Today, the rail cars are being extended in many parts, whilst the electric train service between Wellington and Johnsonville has already commenced. In addition to the material advances, the wages and conditions of the railway employees have been greatly improved. And as a result of the shortening of hours, the staff is greatly increased. The development of the Safety First campaign has been enormous under labour rules. The antiquated and dangerous road and railway crossings are disappearing one by one. Fifty of these death trap crossings have already been eliminated. The Labour government is determined to get rid of these death traps on our highways. Hence these overhead bridges. 53 are already under construction at a cost of 260,000 pounds. This is money well spent in the cause of humanity. The Ruth Bridge is making a canal 40 miles in length, which will make water available to the whole of the Canterbury Plain, Rangitata and Rakaia. An outstanding advantage of this scheme will be the establishment of hydro work to utilize the spare water power during the winter months when the demand for electricity is at its peak. Under national rule, farmers were faced with ruination and despair, 
and many were forced to leave. Farmhouses were in disrepair and bankruptcy set 50,000 farmers in the face. The change that has come over the farming outlook is a miracle. Just like the harvest in this picture, the farmers are now reaping the benefits which come from the Labour government's planned economy for farmers. Order instead of chaos in marketing. Plan instead of muddle. Genuine sympathy for the producer instead of cold neglect. A guaranteed price for butterfat, wheat, apples, honey and other primary products gives stability and prosperity to the producers. Arrears of interest were remitted and the mortgage liability reduced by three million pounds. It matters not what branch of farming it is. The working primary producer enjoys greater security and prosperity today than ever before in New Zealand's history. They say that an apple a day keeps the doctor away. Well, more fruit is being consumed than ever. Since the advent of the Labour government, over 70,000 more workers are in constant employment and receiving better wages and more leisure to enjoy a happier and fuller life than was possible in the dark and tragic days of the Depression. Industry has been stimulated, as is evidenced by the fact that over 87,000 new cars are on the road. Proof that the purchasing power of all classes of the community has increased. Just listen to these signs of prosperity. One, salaries and wages have been increased by 34 million pounds annually. Two, post office savings bank deposits have increased by 17 million pounds. That in itself proves Labour's case. Three, registered factories have increased by 1,125 giving further employment to an additional 21,000 people. Four, 2,500 more small businesses have been started. Does that sound like killing private enterprise? The percentage of bankruptcies is the lowest for almost 60 years. Five, this year alone, over 18,000 new telephone connections were made, a record in the history of the department. Not without justification, then, Labour claims that history is being made. These scenes are a daily occurrence. Cars ready to take the road. This enables thousands previously deprived to enjoy the scenic beauties and holiday results of their own country. In those dark days of nationalist rule, dwellings such as these were common. But history was made as Labour launched its gigantic housing scheme. First, the government made available from the Reserve Bank five million pounds for housing the people. 5,422 government houses are being built in 93 towns. Believe it or not, if all the houses being built by the government were placed in a row, one chain apart, it would result in a street of houses 70 miles long to the department at the rate of one in every 40 minutes during working hours. This was a great day, the opening of the first government scheme dwelling. Everybody is happy. The Prime Minister, Mr. Nash, Mr. Semple and Mr. Lee take their coats off and help to carry in the furniture. Truly a red letter day for home seekers. In addition, the State Advances Corporation has made available to those who wish to build their own homes the sum of two and a quarter million pounds during the last two years, as compared with the paltry sum of 64,000 pounds loaned during 1934 and 1935 under the National Party administration, while thousands of master builders and tradesmen were idle. A happy home is the foundation of the state. Here is a case where you must say, let labor carry on. Modern educational methods start the child early. Here are young New Zealanders playing their way into knowledge. The old forces of repression and Toryism are really frightened of education for the masses. 
It is one of the first expenditures to get the axe. We can't afford it, is soon glibly said when it comes to enlightening and improving the mentality of all our young folks. This free kindergarten, of which many are run nowadays, is a vital necessity to the work of making good New Zealanders. Watch them, happy, healthy and contented. The amount appropriated for assistance to kindergartens was increased by the Labour government from £3,510 in 1935 to £10,000 in 1937. Consider what Labour has done for both young and old with the new social security scheme. A pension uh, for orphans of 15 shillings weekly if they should lose their parents before reaching working age. Apprenticeships have increased under Labour rule from 3,929 in 1935 to over 8,000 in 1938. The door of advancement has been opened to youth. Vocational guidance and increased wages for boys and girls in shops, factories, offices and farms, and shorter hours, give more healthful leisure. Family allowances have been liberalized. Average allowable income raised from four pounds to five pounds weekly, and allowance for each child raised from two shillings to four shillings weekly. A job and better wages for father, and the social security scheme, has made the children's life happier and healthier. Under the national government, the five-year-old kiddies were excluded from schools. Training colleges were closed. Schools were in disrepair. Even the school teachers were on relief, and practically all educational grants were reduced. Since Labour took office, more than treble the amount has been spent on educational buildings than was spent by the national government during a similar period. The grants approved by Labour actually totaled £1,400,000. New open-air schools were built, teachers brought back from relief work, and training college students trebled. No economy was so stupid, so utterly futile, so uneconomic as saving on education, on the making of efficient and worthy citizens, the true source of the nation's wealth and welfare. But what a change has come over the scene since Labour took over the reins of government. In a land flowing with milk, the foundation food for the young, it was not available for them. Look at these scenes. No more sea trees. Milk will do the job. Under the Labour government, the free milk scheme is practically everywhere. The scheme was commenced on the 1st of March, 1937. And milk is now available to 160,000 children. And the scheme being extended as rapidly as possible. These kiddies have their milk too, and it's certainly a grand day when they're selected to distribute the bottles. Please, can I have mine? Ha <laughs> ha! The kiddies certainly miss it if they're missed. These little youngsters who will, in 20 years' time, hold the destinies of the Dominion in their hands, are also being catered for with a plentiful supply of the very necessary milk. Here's a delightful and typical scene. If they concentrate on their lessons as well as they do on their daily bottle of milk, well, just think of the conversation for the Rhodes Scholarship. Never has any previous government looked after the children so well, and never were parents less anxious for their future. Just what's this. Wait a minute, Gary, there's another drop there. Care of the teeth is the first thing in health. The Labour government has extended useful and valuable dental clinics. Good teeth mean good citizens. Watch how the youngsters almost enjoy it. Can they take it? Oh, I'll say. In November 1935, the number of student dental nurses was 53. At the present time, there are 140, an increase of 87. A very considerable number of these will shortly be available for work in the school dental clinic throughout the country. Twenty new clinics are being established in districts where, until now, the service had not been available. A number of existing clinics had to be strengthened so that more children could be treated. The training accommodation available was quite insufficient, and a new dental training school is being built.
In spite of the fact that the Labour government believed in international peace and collective security under the League of Nations, it was imperative in view of the unsettled conditions of world affairs, which constitute a definite menace to democracy, to take steps to adequately defend New Zealand. The geographical position of the Dominion necessitates that an efficient air force should be established, and this is rapidly being done. The naval forces have been strengthened, and the land forces reorganized and brought up to date. New Zealand is the scenic wonderland of the world. It's the pocket universe. Rotorua is the finest thermal region on Earth. If the Labour government is enabled to continue its policy, you won't have to see these sights at the movie theatre only. No recreation is as necessary as food. A change of scene is more useful than any medicine. The marvels of Rotorua and all New Zealand resorts will be possible for everyone to see. The Labour government's objective, and it is within reach, is to make New Zealand more than ever a tourist paradise, the playground of the Pacific. But you will be tourists too, and you will have the right to play in your own playground, your own country. Hope has been restored to the Maori people. For instance, Maori arts and crafts have been encouraged. Maori housing and health schemes have been extended and accelerated. <laughs> them justice and happiness, as many new native schools have been erected. And the Mary Land Development Scheme is being pushed forward with renewed vigor. History was made when the Labour government placed the Mary on an economic equality with his Pakeha brother. They too will vote Labour. Another evidence of increased prosperity is evidence in the fact that 131,000 more radio licenses are in existence than in 1935. Parliament was brought to the people's fireside when the government inaugurated the broadcasting of parliamentary debates. Remember, these wonderful achievements have been made possible within our own income and without borrowing from overseas. Hold fast to prosperity. On Saturday, October the 15th, vote Labour again. Thank you.